my story from 1993. That was the year that I was trying to finish high school and uh, going up, going through all these, um, you know, these uh, sort of strange moments that you do when you're finishing high school, uh, trying to achieve, but um, not really getting where I needed to be at school. Funky Town is the name that we had for Frankston, which is where I live. So Frankston's an hour from the city. Back then it was right on the edge of the urban sprawl. Um, the urban sprawl's uh, far surpassed that now, but, but Frankston's still relatively the same. It's, uh, it's a place that I loved growing up in um, and so I've spent most of my life here, but uh, one of the nicknames we had for it was Funky Town. And that's mainly from people who live here, who can, um, who, who, and my little sister used to call it Funky Town with a, a, a cheeky grin, because we all know what, what Frankston is. Um, and for us, it was a great place. At that time, though, it was a really scary time with um, a serial killer on the loose, a serial killer who murdered three women. All through that winter, police came in great numbers, record numbers. Uh, the national media came to Frankston for the first time and, and uh, we were in that whirlpool of, um, of fear and frustration and uh, town meetings and trying to work out how we could live through this period. But uh, the streets were empty and um, there were a lot of people really uh, pa paralysed by the fear of it all. So that's the backdrop and, and the rest of it is my story, trying to navigate not only school, but also trying to make it into the AFL. When I was writing the majority of the book uh, in its final draft, I was in lockdown and it did feel the same. Um, as 1993 with those empty streets and uh, frustration and, and people scared and uncertain about what was going to happen. Um, you know, the, the pandemic in its first stages felt like that's that time when the serial killer was in Frankston. Um, the, the timing for me was, I'd wanted to write this book for a long time, but it felt like a good time. It explores uh, themes of boys becoming men and masculinity uh, and, and that's a big discussion everywhere now, which is a really good thing. I, I wanted people to be able to understand the themes as their own. So the, the book is, I didn't write the book because I think my life has been extraordinary or, or even my, my uh, 18th year on earth was, was extraordinary. I, I wrote it because I think it's actually really common for people to, to feel the way I did as, as a boy and that's, um, you know, that's with that false bravado that I got around with and, um, you know, it's, it's a stifling way to, um, to be a teenager. I had great friends through that time. So there, there wasn't, although I went through a, a range of emotions, I just, I thought I, this was pretty normal and, and uh, you know, I had, a, I had a lot of fun. I was playing football for the Stingrays team, um, which was that representative under 18 team. And I was having great experiences. I played at the MCG. I always wanted to do that. And in the end, I, I didn't play anywhere near, near as uh, well as I had dreamed I might. But you know, I I, I, uh, I was having some good times along the way. Uh, but certainly, the bad choices that I made were to do with uh, not being able to express myself. So that that is a theme that runs through the book, and, and absolutely deliberately because I think that. Um, I think that's a, a really common thing for 17 year olds to feel re rejecting or disparaging uh, what boys see to be as feminine, uh, which is, you know, being creative and wanting to find love and, and all of those things, which, which I dearly wanted to do at that time, but couldn't really express that. And, and instead I, I, I was a binge drinker and I, um, I embraced this, this, um, this lifestyle of, of getting into fights and all those sorts of things. So, the, the timing, I think, was had to do a little bit with my sons, but also I've always wanted to write the book and, and I thought um, I couldn't wait any longer. I had a lot of good teachers along the way in primary school and high school. I was really lucky in that regard as well. I had a beautiful family, I had uh, great teachers. So there were no shortage of people in my life that were trying to um, help me uh, go from childhood to adulthood and, and, um, and lead a good life. But there was one teacher who made a, a 
big difference to me in my life, Mrs. Mack. She gave me a book called I Heard the Owl Call My Name. And looking back and writing the book, I can really pinpoint that as a significant moment for me because I, was, I wasn't a big reader growing up. I, I would like to say, you know, as an author and as a journalist of 25 years, I would like to tell you that you know, I, I was reading Dickens at uh, 10 and 11, but I wasn't a big reader. There's a, it's a beautiful book, as many people know. It's a classic. Um, it's something I wouldn't have chosen for myself about a, a religious minister who goes to live in a, an in, with an Indigenous tribe in British Columbia uh, to learn enough about life that he's ready to die because he's terminally ill. Never in my wildest dreams would I have looked twice at this book, but when she gave it to me, and, and she was a very influential person in my life, I read it and I can distinctly remember the words and the sentences in that story um, causing me to feel a, a sense of electricity and, and uh, this great excitement and um, just that, this great satisfaction from reading this beautiful, beautiful story that I could only ever get through playing football. So I thought, well, if, if this makes me feel as good as, you know, playing footy, then, then I'll keep reading. So reading's been a big part of my life ever since. And, uh, and that, was, that was really um, due in a large part to Mrs. Mack giving me that book and being a great literature teacher in my VCE years. But it was a bit more than that because Mrs. Mack was the one that suggested I get into journalism. And so, so when I was, my high school days were, uh, were falling apart around me and I ended up getting expelled for, for an incident um, uh, on the night before markup day and ended up in, in police custody. Uh, the, the seed had already been sown for me to maybe try journalism. Uh, going back to 1993 was, was really interesting to me. In fact, I went to the local library, Frankston Library, and, and went back through all of the, um, all of the newspapers of the time and, and read them all again. And because you had, in writing a memoir, I think it's helpful if you can measure your memories against uh, some documents of the past. And, and I was lucky, my mum never threw anything out. So um, all of the things that I write about in the book um, have almost got that evidence still there. So, um, but my memories were strong. And the, the other part of, of writing this book was, I was, was in a lockdown last year, uh, writing a fair bit of it and rewriting a fair bit of the book. And so one of the things you could do in lockdown, one of the few things was go for walks. And so I was living in the same suburb and still live in that same suburb where I grew up on the, on the outskirts of Melbourne. And when I went walking, I was walking past crime scenes from 1993. And I was uh, you know, walking through the, the tea tree of the local beach. That, those times reminded me that, you know, that it hasn't changed all that much. And uh, you know, it's 28 years ago. Those, that, that, that murderous spree feels like yesterday. It doesn't, doesn't feel so long ago. But also the place that I'm that I'm still living in doesn't feel like 28 years ago. It's, uh, I, I look at the place around me now as a, as a father, a married man who's got uh, three kids and my, my mum and dad still live in the, in the same house, but uh, you know, I guess the suburb is smaller than what I remember. But um, I've all, always loved living here. We grew up in a, a housing estate, which was brand new to the area. And I thought it was paradise. And, and looking back, I still do. We were, Houses were springing up on the street. Um, you know, we were playing, the frames of the houses were our monkey bars. And, you know, we'd, we'd set up jumps out the front on the, on the footpath and, uh, you know, just to take the skin off our knees. And uh, it was a typical suburban uh, upbringing and everyone was young. It, even, the new, even the school we went to was brand new. So everything was new and even, even the adults seemed young. It was a, it was a youthful place without any, any of the problems um, that I would grow up to then and later learn was, was quite normal in the world. I view the place as a great place to grow up, great place to raise kids. And uh, in that way, it hasn't changed all that much. But, uh, you know, you sort of, that's my experience. And I'm, I'm sure other people have 
vastly different experiences. Once you write a book like this, uh, you're best to, to leave it to the reader and, and they can take what they can from it. But I'm hoping that particularly if my sons read this book, they might pick up that it's better to be yourself than to follow the crowd. And um, you will, when you, you reach those teenage years, you're, you're open to influences of role models and friends around you and all the rest of it. But my advice would be to be yourself. And for me, that was, you know, that was not something I felt comfortable doing. I was, uh, you know, I, 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 I adopted a macho image. Um, I, I made out that I was, you know, that I was up for a fight and I wanted to drink and all, all those sorts of things, but that was driven largely by insecurity. And, and so, yeah, I, I think a takeaway from my experience might be that it's, and certainly by the end of the book, you, you reached, I've reached the conclusion that um, it's better if I take off that mask of bravado and just be myself. I open myself up to different relationships. Um, a whole new world would open up to me if I, if I wasn't um, restricted by this, this culture of, of masculinity. So that's perhaps the, the, the thing that I hope people take out of it. And, um, you know, if they learn a bit more about me along the way, then that's, uh, that's good too. And, and also I hope they have a laugh because, um, you know, there's some funny things that, that happen there. Um, you know, I didn't take everything so seriously and I did have some good friends and um, had some, some, uh, some good times along the way.